and turn there to 1 John. I jumped right into it, didn't I? Both feet. But 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. But I hope to present a truth tonight. I hope to present something that will be a challenge to us as far as considering and thinking about our religion and our, not so much Baptist or whatever, but our practices in our, in our life and what we do and um, to see what does God truly want? What does God intend for us? And what does God want for us? Before we jump into this in 1 John chapter 1, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help and blessing upon this time. Lord, we love you. We do thank you so much for your blessings and your grace. As we sang about that, Lord, that is sobering to think in us, we're nothing. And yet, how often pride comes in, we think we're something, yet without you, we have nothing. And Lord, I thank you so much for your grace. I pray that you would give me grace tonight to speak this message and this truth um, in a way that's understandable and in a way that can just you can use to touch hearts and draw them closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To review quickly, um, last week, as I said, we talked about that idea of Gnosticism. I was thinking a little bit of that whole idea and mentality. I'll try not to run too far, but no, I guess I can put this on. That way I can run around while I'm doing that. Okay, so my traveling mic so I can travel while I'm talking. But the Gnosticism, that idea of that Gnostic, that knowledge, but it was the whole idea of deeper knowledge. And we'll see an example of that in the Bible in Acts 17 later on. But that knowledge that they were talking about, get this turned on here. All right, there we go. They were looking for that divine truth, divine way to find through their inner being, inner self. And um, trying to explain that and figure it out on their own without God. Gnosticism, though, is a form of reasoning that puts God as an abstract force that is separate and unattainable to man. As we were talking about one of the, the points mentioned last night, or last night, last week, when we were, um, somebody had a question and, and we had thought about, well, how does that relate to today? What, what would be an example of of something like that today. And I think our higher education system is the perfect example of that. Always trying to present to the students and present to people a way of reasoning and philosophy and all these things that come from within, leaving God out, starting all the way from the very foundation, creation. No, there is no creation. It all happened by chance. It was a big bang. It all came together, and these things are all chance, all chances coming together. No, there was an organized God and creator that made it. That's the logical conclusion that any logical person would come to. But no, we've, we've inserted our own opinion. And because of that, we've taken away God. We've taken God out of that and out of that thing. And that's what was happening here. They were trying to put the idea of a deity, God, in the form of a reasoning and an abstract force, you know, that's out there. It's there. It's part of it, but we can, really can't understand it unless you get this deeper, deeper th reasoning that's here that only some of us can attain to as we reach and we find it in our innermost self. And uh, that's not what God wants for us. In 1 John chapter 1, he tells us there in verse number 1, he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. And he uses that word. See, it's capitalized there, the word of life. Now, it's so clear that this was written by John because you see in John chapter 1, verse 1, very similar thought there. John 1, 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And he, he jumps right into it, getting into the very basic foundational truths that's here. The goal of this study, then, is to build on this idea of the Word. Now, we can be smart and educated and say the Logos, as it's referring to. But I think there's an interesting history, and I'm going to, hopefully I don't bore some of you with this, but there's some, yeah, wake up! Yeah, I'll have to do that. We'll do, we'll do a praise God in between there somewhere. I'll get Brother Jackie to give us a good amen, right? Yeah, he'll, he'll shout it out for me later on. So that'll get you waking up. But I think as we look into it, Logos is the Greek word referring to communication, understanding and revelation 
And they had taken that to, in, to try to understand, in a general sense, the deity or the divine being outside of our realm of every day. So they were using this word logos. It has a long history and the evolution of the idea. So I'm going to read this part. And I, I warn you. Stay with me and I'll explain it as we get to it. But the evolution of the idea it embodies is really the unfolding of man's conception of God. To comprehend the revelation of the deity to the world has been the aim of all religious philosophy. While widely spread views of the divine manifestation have been conceived, the Greek word logos has been employed with a certain degree by a series of thinkers to express and define the nature and mode of God's revelation. So logos, or logos, signifies in classical Greek both reason and word. Reasoning and word. Of course, we talked about last week, I ended with using the idea of word as a means by which we portray thoughts and ideas, and we give those across, the word, and that's how God uses it. But according to Greek thought, the, log the logos was conceived as a rational principle of impersonal energy, by means of which the world was fashioned and ordered, while according to, of course, the Jews and God's way, the thought of Logos was divided, or regarded rather as a mediating agent or personal member of the divine being. The Greek thinking was chiefly a doctrine as the Logos being reason. The more we reason this out and we philosophize and we come to a deeper understanding, then we can get into the depths and, and attach to basically this force. And that's where that idea all came from that as we acted out, Pastor had talked about that, or I can't, I get him mixed up, Pastor or uh, Brother uh, Yates or whatever, at the, the teaching on Wednesday or uh, from the, the Institute. But one of them was talking about it. But the other idea that he was talking about is that as they acted out something here on earth, the gods would see it in heaven and then they would act it out and then their blessings would pour down upon earth. And that's why they had the, you know, they talked about, I won't mention it for the, all the teens and stuff here, but all the wickedness that was going on, because they'd say, this will help them to bless us if we act this way and do these things. Crazy. It was crazy thinking, but it evolved from this idea that they were trying to get in touch with that outer, uh, outer mystical being, out force that's out there. And so their thinking here was all twisted in that way, whereas... God's thinking, he says, I want to reveal you this as my word, as my word. And that's where he gave this, the idea of reaching into that, then the deity that's out there, it truly is God, who is an organized way. And so John presents this in this fashion. He says, look, what I'm telling you is that this idea of the logos that you're talking about, that you are trying to reach out and come in touch with, he says... It's not this spooky, mystical, outer thing. It's a real person, and that's why he described it. That which was from the beginning. And then he goes on. This is why he goes into all this detail here. He says, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. That means we didn't just, you know, you know it was a passing by thing. No, we, we gazed upon him, and we learned from him. He was a being that was here and was with us, walked with us, and our hands have handled. This isn't an abstract force. This was a real person, a real being. The divine came to man. That's what the incarnation means. The incarnation, it means that God became man. He became flesh for us, who knew no sin, that we might have the righteousness of God through him. That's what he did for us, but he became flesh for us. So God who came and became known. So John's saying all these things. He's saying, I want you to understand this. You've got to get this. And here's some ways that he reveals himself to us. The God who is made known in Scripture is regarded as one who actively reveals himself. He is exhibited thereby as making his will known by his spoken word and by certain means. The word of God is presentive, presented, first of all, as the creative Principle in Psalm 33, verse 6. Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And I'm going to go through these verses quickly because I want to jump into the content um, and apply it here 
But just some brief thoughts. It says, Psalm 33, 6, again, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Also, it's used as an instrument of judgment, the word of God, an instrument of judgment. Hosea 6, 5, it says, Therefore have I hewed them by thy prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. By the words of the mouth. This, this divine being, through this, used this judgment that he would bring. And also as a healing agent then. In Psalm 107, verse 2, he sent his word and healed them. Very briefly, very simply put, he healed them. And as he talks about these things, he's saying, John is trying to point out there's a strong affirmation that the Son of God, this divine being, came and he revealed himself as the Word. But notice, not only as the Word, but he included in that the Word of life. The Word of life. In him is true life. Not this abstract outside thing, but true life, true living. John chapter 1 again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference back and forth because it describes it so well here. In John chapter 1, verse number 1, I'm going to put, put something in there. It says, in the beginning was the Word. We talked about that. The same was with God. And he says in verse 3, all things were made by Him. So that creative force that's there, which is God, that divine being that spoke this world into existence. Now there's power. He spoke it into existence. Ex nihilo. That means out of nothing. That's how he did it. He spoke it out of nothing. All things were made by him and without him. Who? The word. The logos that he's talking about here. Was not anything made that was made. In him was life. He jumps right into it. And the life was the light of men. Next point. The light then. And the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Now jump down. Verse 14. Verse 14, he says, And the Word was made flesh. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Think about how precious those words about him. Dwell on that and think about that. The Word was made flesh, number one. The Word was made flesh. God, as we said, I'm not going to belabor it, but he, he came down. The divine God who created spoke this world into existence took upon him this human, he humbled himself, it says, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Todd describes it in Philippians chapter 2. But this God, he made flesh, he dwelt among us. He didn't dwell in some palace, aloof and set off from everybody. No, he walked with the common folk. He was there with the fishermen, with the tax collectors, with the publicans, with all the people. He was criticized for that because he was with the people. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And how was that glory described? Look at that last part. Full of grace and truth. So, and I, I inject the idea of mercy, mercy and grace going hand in hand. So he's grateful, he's merciful, yet he is the epitome. He is the foundation of what truth truly is. What truth is. So John's telling these people, look, here he is. The evidence is all here. That abstract thing is not abstract. The Logos, that, that abstract being isn't, he's real. And he's come. He's been present with us. And he paid for our sins. He gave us this opportunity. But he has a purpose and a reason for it. As we continue on, we're looking at 1 John again, going back there. His declaration on this point, he repeats by putting the statement into a variety of form. Talking about the senses that we use then. This, and we've seen them in all these different senses. We've touched, we've handled, we've seen, we've looked, we've heard, you know, even. You could say that. And then verse 2, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life. That eternal life. So he says the word of life, it's that, that gives you the eternal life. Now, there's something that a lot of people think as being abstract, right? They say that abstract, that mystical thing, the idea of eternity. That after we die, there's a place in this, you know, that there's an eternity, there's a heaven, and there's a hell. And, you know, that's just for religious crazy people. That's not really the reality. I mean, goodness, we live here, we live our life, we die, and that's it. It's over. That's so many people's mentality, and yet there's something inside of everyone that says, hmm, I don't think so. I think there's something else. 
God has put that inside of each one of us. God has given to us. Now, as people, they harden their hearts to it and do that, you can, you can quench that voice. You can push it out, quench the Holy Spirit it talks about. But the idea that it's there, and they say, but we're going to deny that, that reality, really, the reality that there is an eternity. And he says, when you deny that, you're missing out. Because he, this, this is just a short breath. It's just a short, short time. It's as a vapor. And then we have eternity. There's true reality forever and ever and ever. That's reality when we, spend, when we have the opportunity to spend it with him in fellowship with him. And he's pleading with them to understand these things. He's saying, you've got to listen. You've got to understand this. He does this in a similar fashion, as I mentioned before. Turn to Acts chapter 17. As Paul was reasoning with these people here, in Acts chapter number 17, we see this. He goes to the city of Athens. And look at verse 16. You can see the heart of Paul. Acts chapter 17 there in verse number 16. It says, now, while Paul waited for them at Athens. There, now, let me explain. Athens was the center of Greek culture and philosophy. It was the center of Greek culture and philosophy there. So while he was waited for the, at, at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him, for he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Now, what does that mean? Think about it this way. If you've got these idols, and we'll see it in a minute here, but this, these idols are all over the place. There's, it's full of idols. And it's, it pictures or symbolizes that people are searching for a deity. They're searching for something that is going to give them the answers. And they're searching it through all these false means. And it stirred his heart. He was saddened, and he was stirred by it and said, I have the truth, and I want to share with them how they can get to the true, uh, the true one. So he... Therefore, you look at verse 17, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics, very quickly, they were the two opposites. Epicureans lived for satisfaction and self and, and indulgence and, and fleshly lustful desires. They lived for themselves. I mean, their basic philosophy was it feels good, do it. That was it. And that was all about, that was self-fulfillment. It gave them new enlightenment. And that was, we kind of covered that last week. On the opposite side, the Stoics, just like it says, they were very Stoic. Happiness was bad. You weren't supposed to be happy. You were supposed to be miserable. You were supposed to have all these things. And then you are succeeding in life. You are really good if you are self-disciplined and you are beating yourself and doing that kind of stuff. They were the epitome of the opposite side of it. And that's how you attain to this higher level of knowledge and higher level of feeling. So he's, these certain philosophers are there. And he encountered him and they said, what will this babbler say? So they're kind of mocking him. Others, he seemed to be set, or uh, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods. When they've got all these other gods and they can't figure out who they're serving anyways. Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And that's what really got him was the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine, whereof thou speakest, is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So it was all about philosophy and getting the deeper meanings of things. So then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. You're, you're, too, you're too full of yourselves. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. You want to know the unknown God? Let me tell you who he is. Just like John was saying, you want to know who the Logos is? The Logos is? It's Jesus. It's Christ. That's who he is. He says, I'm going to declare to you who the unknown God is. God that made the world and all the things therein. 
Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. It's not about all these, these statues and all these things that are here. That's not for God. And he goes on to explain it. I won't for sake of time. And at the end, what did they do? Verse number 31, he warns them because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. And so Paul departed from among them. Now some listened, as you see in the next verse, but most just said, hmm, that was a nice intellectual thing, but I don't really believe it. Yeah, I don't believe that. And that's how they view. They look at it as religion, and they look at it as a, a form of philosophy and different things. And so going back to this idea, John's presenting to them and saying, this is truth. This is reality. Just as he was saying, you, there's an unknown God. Let me present you to the truth. Hey, you know who the Logos, you want to see this deity? Let me present who he is. And now he goes on and continues on. Look back at 1 John. As we get into this and understand this now, he says, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto you, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you for this purpose. Here it is. There's the purpose. That ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. He says that he wrote them in order that they might have fellowship with him in the belief of this truth, that God had been revealed to them, had been brought to them. He says, and they might then partake in the joy which flows from the doctrine that the fact, or the fact that the Son of God had actually come in the flesh. For what purpose? For fellowship. Now, of course, to die and to pay for our sins. That's the most and primary purpose. But why did he do that? Why did he pay our sins? So we could fellowship with him. To have fellowship. Man was created for fellowship. Man was created to have fellowship with God. To walk with God. Here's some examples of what the fellowship looks like that God wants to have with us. The fellowship with Christians, which Christians have with God, relates to the following things. It is an attachment or an agreement to the same truths, the same objects, the love for the same principles, the same ideology. God wants us to fit, to come alongside and to conform and to, to be of the same mind as him. And that is the goal that we have. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We want to have the mind of God. We want to walk with God. And as we get closer to God and we understand more of God, we are going to then be more in tune with him and more in that same mindset. And because of that, we can then have that fellowship, sharing the same kind of happiness. The happiness of God is found in holiness, truth, purity, justice, mercy. The happiness of the Christian is of the same kind that God has. And that's what we should have. We want to build on that and find our joy in those things. Not finding our joy in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. As a Christian, that sh you know, and we'll fall prey to those sometimes, but they should bring emptiness. They should bring dissatisfaction. They should bring, a, they should bring a, that guilt. You know, we say guilt's a bad thing. Well, it brings us then to reconcile and to bring it back to where we can have that joy again and that peace with God. So that, that's part of that fellowship. Co-laboring with God. That's part of the fellowship that he has for us. We get to be yoked with him in that. As Jesus gave that example, he says, take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light. He says, work with me in the same. He gives some verses. I'll give them very quickly. But this idea, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, it says, for we are laborers together with God. We are laborers together with God. That's amazing. I always think of that illustration when I think of that, of the little kid that's out mowing the lawn with dad. Dad's pushing the lawnmower, the kid's underneath holding that little bar there, and he's pushing, yeah, we mowed the lawn. Actually, you probably were slowing them down. You know, you're holding on <laughs> and trying to do that, but that's how we are with God. God says, I'm going to use you. I want to work with you. I want to work through you. So Mark 16, 20, and they went and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. 
And isn't that neat? When you're, when you're given over to God, if you've experienced this before, or had that time, when you're surrendered to God, you're out there, you're talking, and things come that you're like, huh, where'd that come from? I didn't even, I didn't even know I knew that. And these verses come to mind or things come to mind as we're talking to somebody and, and you say, wow, thank you, Lord. That was from God. And we're laboring with him. That's part of the fellowship. We have fellowship with God by direct communion with him in prayer, in studying his word, and in meditation. So that's a, another way. We have it through prayer, through communion with God, bringing, casting all your cares upon him, intercessing, interceding on the behalf of others. We bring these things before God and, and coming to the throne of grace, as it describes there. Christians will have fellowship with God in the end in the triumphs that he has. So those are some of the means that we see the fellowship that he has for us. And so often, as we practice our religion, this is something that happens. I was thinking about this as an example. You know, in October, I took a trip to Romania. And I got to go with my little nieces and nephews that were there. They're from France and from Romania, and, and so they're speaking another language. And uh, they don't know English, but um, any of them. So they know different languages. So what we do for fun is we got Duolingo. Duolingo, you know, I'd sit down there. So I'm learning the Romanian words with the kids as we're sitting there. And uh, they'd say it, and they'd, they'd help me out, and they'd laugh at me because I'd say it funny or whatever. I couldn't say it right. And so then I get the words, and so I'm studying this. So I use this Duolingo, and I'm like, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to learn Romanian. So the object of using Duolingo was to learn another language. I'll have you know, I have a 120-day streak that I've been on now. And you know what? That's what it's become about. I'm keeping the streak up, and I'm gaining more points, and I'm passing this level, and oh, I passed that person, I'm doing this. Am I really learning Romanian? I don't know. It's become a secondary object in this. It's getting the points and keeping my streak alive so I can say I've gone 120 days without missing the day, and I did my lesson, and I fulfilled my duty to feel like I accomplished something. And honestly, I had to consider and think, am I really trying to learn Romanian anymore? And the answer is no. In reality, no is the answer, the true answer. And so I have to pull back and say, I do want to learn Romanian. So this has to become about learning this language instead of getting points, beating the next person, doing the next thing, and keeping my streak alive. Apply that to religion. What is it about? It's about fellowship with God. It's about walking with our Savior. It's about pleasing Him and doing what He has called us to do. But how much does religion then become something about fulfilling duties? I, I did better than them. <laughs> Boy, I have better standards than they do. Boy, I don't listen to that kind of stuff. I don't watch that kind of stuff. I'm a good guy. And it becomes about self-righteousness. And it becomes about lifting. And all of a sudden, what, what about the fellowship? The reason I want to do those things, going back to the illustration, the reason I want to do this is so I can learn a language. The reason I want to have this relationship with God is so that I can be pleasing with him. So I am not going to watch certain things, or I'm not going to listen to certain things, or I'm not going to go certain places because I want to honor my Savior. But so often it becomes, instead of that, it gets replaced with the pharisaical mindset of look at how good I am and how spiritual I am and how wonderful I am. And guess what? At that point, we've lost the purpose. We've lost that fellowship that he truly wants from us and what it's truly about. We've gotten our eyes off of it. He says, I want you to understand this fellowship. I want you to understand what he has. I want you to, first of all, as we said, I want you to understand that God has come and revealed himself to you. This that you've been looking forward to, he's here. He came. And I want you to now know that he wants to have fellowship with you. He wants to have a relationship with you. Walk with you. Not just make a way for you to have eternity in heaven, but he wants you to have some heaven on earth right now. And so he goes on and he says that, he gives this example, he says then, 
These things write we unto you, for what purpose? That your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. Think of the times that you have, you know, think back. Now, you can think, I say carnally. Uh, that's not the right word to use. Think of something in just that you thought, boy, that was so much fun. And when I got done doing that, I just had, so, I felt so excited. It was such a thrill. And usually what that is is an adrenaline rush of sorts. It was something that you did that, whoa, I conquered this or I did that. I accomplished this. And it brought this feeling of achievement or satisfaction or something of that nature. Now we think of that. You may have something going through your mind. I may have lost some of you. You may be thinking about, oh, yeah, and then I won't have you the rest of the time. <laughs> so come on back now. Let's think about that and apply that. Have you experienced that from God's word? Or have you experienced that time in fellowship with God? Now, I, I hope you have. I hope you've experienced some of that, that where you've actually, the feeling followed the fellowship, the feeling that came along, the joy that came through it. But he says, that's, that's something I want you to have. I want you to have the experience of having this joy, this peace. And as a truth, you know, those are times when I think about it. Usually, usually the time when it's the greatest peace or joy that comes along is after a trial or even during a trial. When, you're, when you see the reasoning for it, you see the end of it or the way out, and you understand. And wow, God's real. God helped you through that. You're, it's through, it's over, or it's, it's almost over, or you see the purpose for it. And whew, God was real. He revealed himself in that time. Can you imagine the disciples? Jesus is walking on the water, you know, and they come to him. They're scared. They're, all these things are happening. And then he says, peace be still. Whoa. Whoa, can you imagine that, that, that feeling that would have come upon them? We are in the presence of truly God. We are here with God. Yet God dwells within us through, with the Holy Spirit. He is there within us wanting to give us, and I, I hesitate to use the word feeling, but it does that. Says, he says your joy may be full. The fullness of joy that he's talking about here. Now, looking at this, it's a present tense idea. The idea of to be entirely filled up is what's there. It's a continuous action, not just a momentary event, but continual. And you say, how can that be possible? Well, here's how it's possible. Turn with me to Psalm 16. Turn with me to Psalm 16. And we're about done. In Psalm 16, and then we'll get into prayer. But Psalm chapter 16, look at this, and I want to close with this idea and this thought as we We meditate on this or think upon this. Psalm chapter 16 there in verse number 11. Verse 11. He says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. God wants to show us the path of that life he's talking about. The word, the word of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. <laughs> now, he tells us that that's a joy that he wants us to have, not just in eternity. Now, that eternity, it, it refers to it in Jude, and I won't take it for sake of time, but Jude 24 talks about that eternity. It, it, it's exceeding joy, exceeding joy at that point. Right now, we get joy. Okay, we can have joy. And, and I want us to have exceeding joy, too, but don't get me wrong. It's not going to be, we can't imagine heaven. But here, he wants us to experience that joy of being at peace and fellowship with God and finding fulfillment and joy in that by walking in his word. And he says, that's what it's all about. I don't have to wait until heaven to enter his presence. I can do that now and enjoy this fellowship, this intimate, close relationship with God. Think of it this way, though. I'm not pursuing joy. I'm not pursuing joy. I'm pursuing God. And as I pursue God, I will have that joy. I will have those things. I'll have that fulfillment. So it's a, it's a matter of faith in this aspect, in this way. The matter of faith is saying, God, I believe your way is best. I believe that the fellowship, that you're, number one, that you're real. 
that God is true and God is real. He's revealed himself to us. He's given, him, given his life for us. Number two, that you want to have fellowship with me. And that it can be obtained and that it does bring joy. So John is saying, hey, we've seen it. I'm bearing witness. Let's go on. Next week we're going to see, now I'm going to give you some light. I want to shed the light. God is the light. And with that light, he's going to expose your darkness and your sin, but he's also going to expose with that the forgiveness that comes with it and the cleansing that comes with it. So we'll look at that next week as we uh, continue on this study. So anyone have any, I closed last week with some questions. Does anyone have any questions or comments on anything in the lesson tonight? Hopefully didn't go too deep, young guys, young teenagers. But uh, having fellowship with God, the sooner we can grasp that and understand that in our lives. Young people, if you can understand that and get that, fellowship with God truly through reading God's word and through prayer, when you experience God and understand that, boy, it's an exciting thing. And it makes the things of this world kind of dim out. All right, if there's nothing else, let's go ahead and we will... Let the teens go out to the outside and Brother Matt.